Thank you all for being here today. For those of you whom I haven't met yet, I'm Dr. France Cordova, the president of the Science Philanthropy Alliance. I want to begin by first acknowledging that I'm joining you from Santa Fe, New Mexico, which is on the unceded ancestral territory of the Tewa people. Like many indigenous communities, the Tewa hold a deep appreciation for the interconnectedness of people and planet, an idea at the heart of our conversation today regarding the nexus of climate change and infectious disease. The Science Philanthropy Alliance draws on a membership base of leading science funders, our esteemed external science advisors, and our skilled team of philanthropic advisors to advance scientific discovery through visionary philanthropy. One way we do that is through convenings like this one to unpack emerging research questions that could be catalyzed by philanthropic funding. And perhaps no two topics have come to the forefront in recent years more than climate change and infectious disease. Both are on their own global challenges worthy of deep scientific exploration across many fields. As I hope you read in the digital pages of the leaps.org magazine though, these two seemingly disparate topics are interwoven in complex, often surprising ways that challenge traditional academic silos. You'll hear today from experts working to understand these interwoven strands and to give us a better understanding of the overarching tapestry they form. I hope you'll come away from the conversation with the grasp of the questions emerging from these interdisciplinary efforts and how they could overlay with your own work. Before we begin our program, I also want to thank our partners at the Aspen Institute's Science and Society Program and at leaps.org. Without their expertise, this symposium and the fantastic One Health, One Planet publication wouldn't have been possible. And that includes Jelana Sheets, whom I'll pass it off to now. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for coming today. We are very excited about this event. My name is Jelana Sheets, and I'm a Civic Science Fellow with the Aspen Institute Science and Society Program. And we are thrilled for you to be here today um, at today's symposium. We um, have, a, have over 400 people registered from across the world, and we thank our colleagues from the Science Philanthropy Alliance for sponsoring this project, which is a collaboration, as France noted, uh, between the Aspen Institute and Science and Society Program and leaps.org. To share a little bit about science and society, um, the, our program was launched in 2019 by our founding director, Dr. Aaron Mertz. And we convene experts in solutions-oriented strategy sessions, mobilize a diverse constituency of science advocates, and implement public outreach efforts and initiatives. We have four pillars, science and social justice, global science, science policy, and public trust in science. What's great about the magazine and this event is that it cuts across all four pillars. And this is the work that we like to do, touching on all these different levels, and we're able to do so from those who have sponsored us. We hope that this collaboration will continue between Aspen and leaps.org to disseminate the most cross-cutting science to the wildest possible audience through journalistic writing and public events. It's the core of who we are as science and society, and we are very, very, very thankful um, to be able to help convene the world's most foremost thinkers about issues at the intersection of climate and infectious disease. Thank you again. And now we're here from Matt Fuchs, um, the editor in chief of leaps.org. Thank you, Jelana. As Jelana said, I am editor in chief of leaps.org, a nonprofit and editorially independent platform with journalism, podcasts, and events that was created in 2017 with founding partner Leaps by Bayer to raise awareness about discoveries that could solve humanity's greatest challenges while encouraging discussion about the best paths forward. It's been a great pleasure working with Joanna and Aaron with the Aspen Institute, as well as the amazing staff from Science Philanthropy Alliance on this groundbreaking 
One Health, One Planet magazine, which was the impetus for today's event. The notion of breaking down silos that sometimes separate experts in health and the environment is itself an important leap. And the experts featured in the magazine, many of whom we'll hear from today, are uniquely committed to using the holistic lens that's needed to address our toughest challenges. You can access the link to this One Health, One Planet magazine from the event reminder that you got this morning. And you can also find it by visiting either the leaps.org website or the website of the Aspen Institute's Science and Society program. You can read this beautifully designed magazine completely for free with articles by top science journalists on new research related to preventing animal to animal spread of disease, articles about new tools and technology for monitoring these spillovers, recent evolutions in the scientific understanding of microbes, how we can use science to protect and sustain insect populations even as global temperatures rise, and how to predict disease outbreaks in the future among other important topics. Just like the magazine is focused on elevating and highlighting scientific research and innovation, so are our partners, the Aspen Institute and the Science Philanthropy Alliance, as is the impact and engagement company Good Worldwide and the nonprofit Good Institute that Leaps.org is proud to be part of. Good is unique in taking solutions-oriented approaches and showing how science can be a force for good in the world while connecting to its audience and the audience of its subsidiary Upworthy which numbers 100 million people. We've seen an appetite for this type of coverage with rapidly growing interest in leaps.org as well. I couldn't be more excited for today's event. And now I'd like to introduce our esteemed moderator, Dr. Jenny Punt, a veterinarian and immunologist who has spent much of her career integrating research and teaching. A biology professor at Haverford College for 18 years, she collaborated with students to research T cell, T -cell and stem cell development. She went on to become Associate Dean for Research at Columbia University's School of Physicians and Surgeons, where she was the founding director of an MD MSc dual degree program focusing on interdisciplinary medical scholarship. She then joined the University of Pennsylvania's School for Veterinary Medicine in 2017 and is now the Associate Dean of One Health and Professor of Immunology. She works to develop interprofessional and educational programs that provide our new generation of leaders with skills they need to address complex challenges that impact human, animal, and environmental health. Hello, Dr. Punt. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you so much. I'm here to highlight our remarkable panelists um, and to give you a sense of the flow of the panels. And we have such a remarkable group. They will each only have about two minutes um, to talk. Um, so I, I first, I will introduce them. There'll be three panels of four people each, and there'll be a prompt that each of them will respond to. Uh, this remarkable group of panelists, I think all of us here, and including some of the people in our audience who are um, all of you are equally remarkable. Uh, we know that multidisciplinary approaches and an interdisciplinary lens are very important uh, for addressing some of the complex problems that we Face, probably all of the complex problems that we face. Uh, and this group of people are those who don't just recognize that as an important principle, but actually act on it. They're on the front lines and they're on the front lines developing innovative co collaborations um, and innovative approaches. They don't just identify the challenges for us, which is a very important step, but they're actually finding ways to address those challenges in ways that give us hope for our future. Um, our first a uh, panel is a group of people who know very well the complexity of climate um, change and um, its relationship with in infectious disease. Um, but they also have a understanding of how important land use is in our vulnerability to infectious disease. Our four panelists in the first panel uh, will be Dr. Jamie Reeser, who is the president and CEO of Giving Voice to Resilience and a scientist in her own right. Um, Dr. Dan Becker, assistant professor of biology at the University of Oklahoma. Um, Dr. Jonah Kuhl, science program officer in the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. Um, and Dr. Neil Vora, physician and policy fellow at Conservation International. We're gonna start with Dr. Reeser and our prompt um, is what do we need to know about our relationship with land to begin to address challenges associated with climate change and infectious disease. Thank you, Jenny. 
from my perspective, the most important thing we need to know about a relationship with land, which is also relevant to freshwater and marine ecosystems, is that we need to protect to prevent. That is, we need to protect and restore ecological systems in order to prevent future outbreaks of zoonotic diseases, those diseases that move between animals and people and that are transmitted by pathogens, disease-causing microorganisms. So I'd like to illustrate my point by introducing a model known as land use induced spillover, the land use induced spillover paradigm, Lewis uh, for short. It's a conceptual model that I recently developed with numerous colleagues, including Dan Becker on this panel. So if you imagine a diagram with a timeline that runs from left to right, on the left side, you have habitat destruction or some sort of land use change. And on the right, you have, um, disease spreading through human populations, something that we're all intimately familiar with, unfortunately, at this point in time. So the question is, how do we move from left to right in this process? It's this cascade of events that we refer to as infect, shed, spill, spread. So according to this model, which is very simply stated conceptually, wildlife becomes stressed due to some sort of land use change, a stressor on the environment, that makes wildlife more susceptible to pathogen infection through various processes, many of which we don't yet understand. And the stressed wildlife then be, may become more prone to the release, what we call the shedding of pathogens into the environment. That can occur through excrement, through blood, through bites. And that moves on through the shedding process to other animals. That may be wildlife, it might be domestic animals, and ultimately moves to people where they become into direct or indirect contact um, with these pathogens. Now, some of these pathogens may move from wildlife to domestic animals to people. They may move directly from wildlife to people. Um, but ultimately, they, uh, and sometimes vectors may play a role, ticks and, and mosquitoes in, in transmitting the pathogens to people. But ultimately, they enter the human population. They spill over um, as, as um, as the term spill means spillover in our model, um, from one species to another. And then that spread continues in the human population until we have an epidemic, a, a community level uh, population infected or a pandemic or a regional or, or global uh, infection in the human population. If you consider this process metaphorically, it's like watching a series of dominoes fall. And the goal is to prevent the first domino from tipping over. And in order to do that, you need to protect and restore ecological systems. You need to protect to prevent. Thank you very much, Dr. Reeser. And we'll move on to Dr. Becker, one of your collaborators. Thanks, and, and thanks, Jamie, for, for kind of outlining that process so well. So um, I'm, I'm an ecologist and I think about sort of how both climate change and land use change affect what's kind of happening in our in the wildlife hosts that are harboring these uh, pathogens. Um, and so if you think about the start of that cascade that JD, Jamie has outlined, both climate change and land use can really affect both um, by, by acting as kind of a, a stressor on wildlife, so making unfavorable or suboptimal environmental conditions. This can make animals more likely to become infected um, and more likely to shed these pathogens into the environment, um, spread them to their tick or mosquito vectors, spread them between different species. Um, and so both land use and climate are gonna affect both sort of these infection processes in the wildlife hosts. Um, and we also know from some, some more recent work um, that climate change will also be shuffling all these species around. And so wildlife are gonna move into new areas where they have new contact with different species this is going to produce kind of novel transmission opportunities for pathogens to jump between species that normally would never contact each other. Um, so that provides new opportunities for these pathogen jumps and, of course, for pathogens to then jump um, into humans as well. And, of course, we also know that both climate change and land use will also affect the movement of people um, and both the movement of people and also our own nutritional status, our own immune function in ways that might make us more susceptible to these zoonotic novel pathogens. And so we can really think about how climate change and land use and all the ways that humans are altering the environment are going to feed back and affect multiple levels of this complex hierarchical spillover process. Thank you, Dr. Vector. Dr. Cool, you're next. 
Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Bund. And also thank you to LEAPS and the Aspen Institute and Science Philanthropy Alliance for putting this on. So I'm a geneticist and cell biologist technologist by training. Uh, and so have thought about this question a, a little bit differently and really fascinated by the confluence of both the infectious disease and climate, as well as the expertise on the panel and call. And in thinking about it, um, my mind went to the, the real opportunity and need to understand the steady state, both in human health and also in these you know, complex organisms and environments, and the requirements there to develop and improve the tools by which we measure both um, our steady state in health, as well as disease, as well as the interactions we have with microbes and infectious pathogens, et cetera. Um, and in particular, I think two things came to mind in thinking about those technologies. One is the relevance of which scale we're measuring it at, so as to understand the subtleties and potentially very complex changes that the environment and susceptibility to different types of pathogens might have, um, as well as the, the scale and dimensionality that I think we'll need to measure these processes at to really take an unbiased view and learn um, you know, how they evolve, how they impact our health, how we impact the, the health of those environments, and then the natural process. And then the, the final thing that I thought a lot about in addition to measuring and understanding and characterizing the steady state so as to better understand in high dimensional ways um, how climate and infectious disease are affecting us is also the, the importance and urgency around diversity and representation in these processes and appreciating and knowing that climate and infectious disease are going to impact different global populations in very, very different and uh, very disparate ways. We've seen that and see that regularly occurring. And the fact that often those technologies are not necessarily available or are not developed with those communities as rapidly as they ought to be. Um, and so I think that those are the two big things for me. And that is you know, better measurements of steady state and developing tools, both for measurement of infectious disease and also uh, human cellular systems and then the importance of developing those tools and having them be representative and developed with those communities. Thank you again for. Wonderful, and Dr. Vora. Thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure to be here today. Uh, I'm gonna use the term emerging infectious diseases, which basically refers to infectious diseases whose incidence is increasing or threatens to increase in the near future. So this includes novel pathogens, such as back in 2019, 2020, when the virus that causes COVID first emerged on, on the landscape. Um, and we know very clearly that since the 1940s, emerging infectious diseases have been on the rise. And most emerging infectious diseases originate from animals, particularly wildlife. And some people uh, I've heard have quoted that COVID is a once in a century event, but unfortunately the reality is that in the last 104 years, there have been at least five other pandemics, including influenza pandemics, HIV, and COVID. And so COVID is not a once in a century event. In fact, we are having pandemics on average once every 17 years, and certainly five of six of these pandemics, if not all six of them, have originated from animals. So this spillover that we've already talked about today is a huge factor that's driving emerging infectious diseases and causing massive human morbidity and mortality. And the bottom line is that the reason why emerging infectious diseases are on the rise is because of human activities that increasingly place humans and domestic animals in close proximity to wildlife that creates the opportunity for pathogens to jump because of deforestation, wildlife markets and trade, climate change, poor infection control during animal husbandry, such as intensive livestock production. So very little good has come out of COVID in the last two and a half years. We have millions of people dead. This is a tragedy at, at an catastrophic astronomical scale, but at least now at the very highest levels of government, world leaders are talking about the need to reform future approaches to pandemics. And that includes investing in pandemic prevention as we've already started talking about today, meaning fixing our broken relationship with nature. And this carries massive return on investment. We know very clearly based on the data that when we invest in upstream prevention by fixing that broken relationship with nature, we can prevent outbreaks, epidemics, and pandemics. Thank you so much. Thank you. So we have a luxurious five minutes and we have some questions from the audience um, that I want to make public to you. And then if we have more time, I have things to prompt you with. Um, and thank you for setting the stage for things that we will continue to talk about. So one of the questions was to, um, to Dr. Cool, 
when you say measurements, and we're going to talk about information, and I'd like all of you to think about for your audience, what next steps would you recommend on a level that that could give people that kind of hope and ability on the ground to do things? But Dr. Cool, when you say measurements, do you mean PCR, genomic analysis, video monitoring? What kinds of measurements might help us improve this understanding and make things less broken? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So I, I certainly mean genomics and molecular assays. I think this is one um, class of assays that has been really important both for understanding infectious disease, so metagenomics and, and other you know, PCR-based assays for direct detection. Uh, similarly for human health, so understanding susceptibility in the genome or understanding now um, susceptibility in certain cell types, not necessarily genetically encoded, but with single cell assays, et cetera. But also, of course, with imaging met methods. Um, so, you know, at, at various scales, I think understanding, again, both ecosystem, um, understanding interactions of microbes, pathogens with human body, and also understanding across scale. And, and I think one very important point here is maybe the most exciting thing is not just single measurements, but the ability to start to integrate these measurements and to perform those measurements at scale to get that much richer understanding where I think in particular for these very complex issues, it's going to be necessary. So, so Dr. Becker, you raised something very interesting about uh, the fact that our species are going to be sharing spaces that they never shared before. Um, how important might these measurements be? And um, we'll bring up measurements later too. Um, yeah, uh, definitely important to think about. You know, we 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 can't identify what we're not trying to measure and screen for. And so, on, on the one hand, using broad tools like metagenomics to try to capture a really broad array. Of potential pathogens being shared between species, whether it's wildlife and domestic animals, wildlife and livestock, livestock and humans, it's really important. Um, I would also add from the measurement side, you know, I kind of talked a bit about environmental stress, climate stress, and you know, animals becoming more likely to get infected, to shed pathogens. And that's one area where we still don't have a really great understanding of how that happens. So what are the, the kinds of habitats for the kinds of times of the year? Um, when animals are going to have the most robust immune systems and will that sort of offer a protective service against these kinds of spillover events. One of the, um, the, the terms that Jamie and I introduced in our, our papers was landscape immunity. So trying to create these habitats that are going to kind of promote better health in wildlife and hopefully try to prevent the kinds of pathogen shedding that, that we see that will lead to spillovers and, and outbreaks. So the landscape immunity appeals to me as an immunologist deeply. Um, I will, I, I wanna um, ask Dr. Reeser, um, you brought up the importance of stress in, um, in managing uh, in, your, in your scheme. And um, can you expand on the importance of stress in this spillover um, threat that we face or have faced for a long time? Yeah. Sure, so from the perspective of our model stress is the the trigger point, I guess you could say, um, for the cascade. And of course, how any animal experiences stress uh, is going to be different among species. It's going to be potentially different among um, age classes. It's going to be different among the stress factors. Um, for some organisms, you know, light pollution um, may be a, a subtle aspect um, in their environment that's not stressful. For other organisms, something seemingly um, as um, benign in terms of land use change categories um, as, as lighter sound pollution could be extremely stressful, um, particularly during um, breeding cycles and, and so forth. Um, so there's a lot to be learned about what, what stress means from an animal's perspective, stepping into an animal's um, feet, so to speak, and understanding what stress means to them. And of course, there are likely to be differences in acute versus chronic stressors or, or acute stressors that are, that are punctuated over time uh, in terms of how, how triggers um, get activated within the system. So if, if you're a graduate student looking for research projects, um, wildlife stress is a great place to go. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and Dr. Vora, we do have a question for you. I know you'll be in the next panel, uh, which should start in a minute. So I'll give you this question and maybe it's something that you can develop in the next panel too. Um, uh, with an apology that this might be outside the speaker's field, um, 
Dr. Vora, what are your connections between, what connections between One Health and agroecology do you see? And your reflections on land and reshaping our relationships with nature have um, this individual considering overlaps. The, 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 we've got a minute before the next panel, but go for it. Okay, well, well there's a very strong connection between um, agriculture and uh, spillover events. First of all, one of the largest drivers of spillover and emerging infectious diseases is probably land use uh, changes and, and particularly deforestation. And one of the major reasons why deforestation occurs in tropical settings is to make space for, uh, for livestock rearing. And so th that in and of itself creates opportunities for spillover. And beyond that, when, when there are opportunities for wildlife to interact with, uh, with, with domestic animals, such as poultry, there are again opportunities for spillover, which is an important pathway uh, through which influenza viruses might emerge and, and, and then subsequently spill over into the human population. So there's a strong connection between all of these different drivers. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so thank you. Panel one, you helped to start everything beautifully. I know this is way too quick, um, but let's move on to panel two, who will be developing these thoughts in many ways, and Dr. Vora will be um, remaining among them. Um, we have themed panel two around the question of silos and systems um, relevant to all panels um, with, a, with a prompt. Uh, our experience with the pandemic has revealed the importance of resisting silos and applying a systems, one health, one planet, there are many ways to describe this approach to both research and to policy. Um, what challenges and opportunities in applying systems approaches have you experienced? And feel free to go off script too. Let me introduce um, those who will be members of the panel. Um, we have Dr. Jana Mazet, Mazet or Maze, uh, and she's the vice provost now of Grand Challenges at UC Davis. We have Dr. Jonathan Sleeman, who is um, the center director of the OIE National Focal Point for Wildlife um, associated with the USGS and the National Wildlife Health Center. And Dr. Neil Vora, um, our, um, our physician and policy fellow, ours for a little while, um, Conservation International. And then um, Dr. McFall Nye, um, the director and the new director of the Division of Biosphere Sciences and Engineering at the Carnegie Institute for Science associated with Caltech. Um, thank you and welcome. And we're going to start with um, Dr. Mazze. Thank you so much. Well, I'd just like to preface, oh, that was interesting. I'd just like to preface uh, with um, the, the background that I have as an epidemiologist and a wildlife conservationist and disease ecologist. I've been able to work on spillover for more than 20 years now. Um, and in doing that, I've been able to engage uh, with more than 30 countries to strengthen their capacity to detect virus spillover, um, diagnose it, and jump into action quickly, as well as understand viruses that might spill over um, in advance and help communities engage and uh, take their own risk uh, into consideration and change their behavior. And what I've found um, that I think is really critical is that um, people often don't understand. You heard a whole bunch about spillover in the previous panel, which was excellent. People don't often understand that these viruses and wildlife hosts that, as Dr. Vora said, are often the hosts of the emerging infectious diseases, they don't leap out and grab us. Um, the, every bit of our exposure risk is really due to our human behavior. And we heard about changing land use, global trade, growth of the human population, explosive growth of the human population. Those things drive us to move into areas that are perhaps more pristine or where we would encounter something that we don't necessarily have any innate immunity or historical or evolutionary immunity to. So for me, it is critical that we work with communities um, to help to understand what those risks are and not sit in ivory towers like my university and um, try to figure out what's best for others. It is really a paradigm shift in the way that we do this work that we need because without it, we will be just sitting ducks. We actually do have um, the knowledge, as Dr. Boris said, that we have this increasing um, 
uh, emerging infectious diseases. Just 10 years ago, we recognized three per year new diseases in people that could become pandemics. Now we know it's up to five, and that's adjusting for and making equal with how we measured before with increasing um, diagnostics. So with that, I'll go let the others go on, and um, hopefully we'll have time for questions. Yeah, I hope so too. And Dr. Sleeman, you're next, uh, following on Dr. Mazzei. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Punter. Thanks, everyone. I appreciate the opportunity to join, join this panel. So I work for the federal government, so I'm going to drill down a little bit into sort of policies and programs. And I think, for, and also touch upon, I, I think, what we'll kind of like start to think about some solutions. And I think one of the biggest challenges that I see in terms of our ability to address emerging diseases at the human wildlife livestock interface is our lack of infrastructure and lack of programs to conduct robust surveillance for diseases and wildlife populations. We have very good public health systems, you know, networks of diagnostic labs. We have very, very good networks of labs and associated programs for agricultural animals, but the similar systems do not exist for wildlife populations. And I think that leaves us very vulnerable you know, understanding risks and, and our ability to, to prevent and manage these diseases. So for example, we currently have SARS-CoV-2 circulating quite widely in white-tailed deer population in, in the United States, yet we have very little knowledge about natural coronaviruses in these species, and therefore a little knowledge about what pot potential risks and, can occur from SARS being in, in white-tailed deer. So we need the, the, the diagnostic capabilities we need the associated data and information management systems so, it, so that, that, that data can get to those people that need to know and can take action uh, and integrate that data into the, some of the other data streams that other, the previous panel was, was, was discussing. Uh, and then finally, we need the governance and the coordination structures necessary to, for all this to happen. I think that brings me to my second point is that um, that coordination and governance is extremely important to breaking down those silos that often exist uh, across the different sectors, particularly in government. In fact, there's often disincentives for us to collaborate. But where I've seen us get together in a One Health approach, I've seen a great success. Uh, I think we were very able to effectively address the sort of COVID-19 and One Health aspects by uh, forming a, a, a federal government co coordination team, um, where we really went from sort of individual missions to address this disease to a collective mission. How can we uh, find mutual benefits from our um, uh, combined work? Um, how can we ensure that we consider sort of the wildlife, the agricultural, animal, environmental aspects of, of these diseases as we develop our interventions and our messaging and our risk communications? And so I think one of the things, but that's been a very reactive approach. I think it'd be really good to actually to proactively create some sort of One Health coordination unit, One Health framework for the, for the federal government so we can be better prepared for the, for the next uh, um, emerging disease. I think the final thing I want to say is I think would, would like to echo a lot of the other comments in that I think in terms of finding solutions to these diseases, we really do need to take a systems approach and a holistic approach. Um, look at some of the root causes to some of these is issues we've been discussing, for example, like land use change, la la land, land use uh, degradation, environmental um, changes and, and, and climate change, and, and look at some of these root, root causes which going back to Dr. Mazette's comments, are very going to be based on human behaviors and human values. We really need to start to change our, our perception of how we value wildlife and how we value the ecosystems upon which we all depend. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sleeman. We've got about um, four minutes left. Um, so Dr. Vora, you're next, and then we'll close with um, Dr. McFall Nye. Uh before joining Conservation International, I spent nearly a decade with the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I responded to the two largest Ebola outbreaks ever on the ground. I, I led New York City's COVID contact tracing program. I found that in general, in the public health sector, we don't think enough about how to prevent outbreaks in the first place. We are not talking enough about the role that deforestation plays in driving outbreaks, epidemics, and pandemics. And, and that prompted me personally to make this switch and, and do the work that I do now. And this is important that we invest in upstream prevention, first of all, because it saves lives. Second of all, because it's, it's a matter of equity. When we wait for outbreaks to happen and then just focus on containing them, it, it leads to inequitable outcomes because we have unequal access to the tools of responding to outbreaks such as vaccines. And a third reason that I would give is that we live in an age of rising populism and mis- 
and disinformation. We're even in countries with virtually unlimited supplies of vaccines, we couldn't vaccinate enough of our populations because there was so much mis and disinformation. And that's a problem not going away anytime soon, which underscores why it's important to prevent outbreaks from happening in the first place. We will never completely prevent all outbreaks, but we can reduce their frequency of occurring, thereby saving lives and promoting equity. Very well put. And Dr. McFall Knight. Yes. <clears throat> First of all, I'd like to say thank you also for, for the invitation. And at this point, I'm, I'm tasked with asking everyone to step back and think about the context of pathogens. Um, so up to, um, uh, well, about 2,300 years ago, um, we, up until very, very recently, we would categorize the biological world based on what we could see with the uh, and aided eye, the eye, and then the aided eye, very good microscopes. And then in the late 1970s, uh, Carl Woese, a genius at the University of Illinois, brought a new technique to the fore, and that is looking at genes, which are the true reflection of our relatedness. And um, he began to reveal the world that we couldn't have known um, the diversity of, and that was the microbial world. But what Carl was doing was slow and expensive. And then around 2008, we got a huge technical breakthrough that made this, this fast and cheap. And so in the last 14 years, we have had hands down the biggest change in our view of the biosphere since Darwin. And so the staggeringly diverse microbial world underlies the health of all corners of the biosphere, um, humans and other animals, plants, the soil and the oceans. And so in humans, <clears throat> of course, we find thousands of species that keep us healthy. And, and what we've got to recognize is that nearly all pathogens are actually related to or derived from, and often derived from, the normal microbial partners that we have. And so they can sort of be viewed as, as spies. So this is what we call, obviously, the microbiome. So the microbiome is now known in the last 14 years to be the basis of many diseases, including cancer, Parkinson's, depression, and the imbalance of, of the microbiome um, with, with um, things like climate change and whatnot is, is something that we need to pay attention to, whether that be in the soil or in the water and, and whatnot. So actually, biology is in a revolution. It's a new day. And if we're going to recognize and develop effective strategies for climate change, I think it's very important that we have in mind um, that the microbial world is actually running most everything. So uh, that was a fabulous foursome. We are forced to go to the next um, panel. However, I wanna tell you that the um, questions are fabulous from the audience. And if you could keep on either the Q&A or the chat, we're trying to monitor both. I think all of you would, your answers would be much appreciated. I wanted to point out that the uniqueness here, um, the human element, the human behavior element is incredibly important. And you've all focused on that. And then our sharing the world and recognizing that we have for our 4 billion years shared the world with microbes. Um, and they are, it is a second revolution. So thank you, um, very inspiring. But please panelists, um, if you can stay on, there are some questions that we'd love you to, um, to feature. So our third panel and our last panel builds on this, um, and just as we hoped, um, you're quite uh, remarkable. And we, we've called this resilience through relationships. Um, and our prompt is associated with the importance of data um, which sounds simple, sometimes sounds dry, but is very important. As multiple panelists have pointed out, we need a more accurate picture of our biosphere um, to address challenges and to develop the approaches that will help us manage these complex problems that we face. Um, please share your thoughts about what is critically important to include in this picture. And it's not just biological data, I am a biologist, but it's also historical data, it's anthropological data, um, knowledge, systems, ways of thinking, what do you feel would be required to include in our picture of our biosphere um, to address um, the future and to keep us in the future? And I have four wonderful people here. Um, Dr. Nicole Redvers, who is the Assistant Professor of Indigenous Health and Family and Community, Community Medicine at the University of North Dakota. Um, Dr. Chris Jurdy, Assistant Researcher of Marine Science Institute at Santa Barbara. Um, Dr. Roklov, 
the Alexander von Humboldt Professor at the Heidelberg University, and um, Dr. Cecilia Sorensen, um, or Sorensen, sorry, um, Associate Professor of Environmental Health Sciences and the Director of the Global Consortium on Climate and Health Education at Columbia University Medical Center. Um, welcome, and we'll start with Dr. Redvers. Hi there, happy to be here. Nicole Redvers, I'm a member of the Dininukoya First Nation in Subarctic Canada. I'm also an Indigenous scholar working to bridge Western and Indigenous ways of knowing as it pertains to individual community, but also planetary health. Now it's important to note that Western science as a paradigm has historically been limited in explaining complex relationships over time and may be in many cases described as a linear, reductionistic, and even mechanistic in some cases. What's important though is the overarching interest in, of Western science has often been to infer phenomenon to understand the world. However, there's often an underlying implicit interest to find ways to influence, control, and perhaps eventually modify these phenomena for human benefit. Now, with underappreciated connections to indigenous science, the pendulum uh, in this 21st century is, is starting to swing towards the need for a more systems oriented ecologically based networking approach, which we've heard from some of the previous speakers. And this approach might seem more aligned to the complexity of planetary health, one health, and other complex systems with which people interrelate. Now, the indigenous scientific method, which could be described as contextual, holistic, symbolic, nonlinear, and relational is not limited by time and uses the collective observation of its people to explain natural phenomena through real but also through metaphoric narratives. It's become very apparent that society cannot solve complex problems from the same worldview that created them in the first place, as it will continue to perpetuate a disconnect between us and the planet as relatives. Now, these points were the determinants uh, or determinations of our indigenous global group of scholars, practitioners, land and water defenders, respective elders and knowledge holders who came together recently to define the determinants of planetary health from an indigenous perspective. With this, I propose we need to stop the narrative of aligning so-called separate sectors such as human, animal, planetary, one health, but instead seek to better focus, describe, and operationalize instead the interconnectedness between systems with a focus on relationships instead of variables alone. Now, with a focus on relationships between variables as opposed to the variables themselves, while being inclusive of traditional indigenous knowledge systems that embody this way of science innately, we will have a better chance of dealing with our multiple crises, including the pandemic, biodiversity loss, which of course can fuel pandemics and even climate change. We need more indigenous presence and more indigenous voices, amplifying and leading through thought experiments and real-time implementation of solutions on the ground, we need Western systems to finally stand up and step back and listen to the longest stewards of the land. Masi Cho, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Redvers. Um, our, our next panelist to follow on that is Dr. Chris Jurdy. Hello, and uh, thank you, Dr. Punt. Um, as scientists, we like to think that we really understand the globe and biodiversity, but in fact, we really don't understand biodiversity and spe specifically quantifying it where high and low biodiversity areas are. And biodiversity includes not only the wildlife that maybe are transmitting a disease and spilling over into humans, but also those the biodiversity of those diseases. And we often think of that, you know, these habitats as static. But thing we know with climate change is that it's far from a static observation of biodiversity. The world is changing as we speak, biodiversity is shifting, and climate change is going to accelerate some of that shift. And along with that is going to be the shifting of pathogens and zoonotic diseases that come into contact with new hosts, uh, including us, and spilling over into new wildlife uh, diseases, but also, and maybe more alarming, opening new pathways for those, uh, those events to occur and, and diseases to come into contact with us. My underlying research focuses on surveillance. How do we go out there and be proactive uh, and prevent or get an idea of what disease is coming next? And unfortunately, sur uh, surveillance is not a very exciting topic in many ways, 
because you go out looking and you often don't find things. You might say we're at the height of surveillance awareness because we're in the middle of a, or we're at the, in, a, in a pandemic. And there's a lot of money being put towards well, how can we do this better? Uh, what can be done next? But we end up with this thing in invasive species world called zeros fatigue, meaning you go looking and looking and looking, and you don't find anything. But that's the heart of surveillance. We have to continue to keep looking. So as far as a major problem that we see in the future, it's how do we overcome the zeros fatigue, waiting for the next pandemic and reducing our resources put towards something that's like surveillance? And then what techniques and methodologies and new technologies can we bring to bear on finding that next pathogen that is likely to spill over into our, into our world? This is gonna take a lot of international cooperative partnerships among government, NGOs, acad academics, business and corporate interests. Um, for large scale biodiversity monitoring programs that include finding invasive species, monitoring threatened and endangered species, shifts in commercial and valuable species, and yes, pathogens and zoonotic diseases that can emerge and cause damages. Thank you, Dr. Judy um, and Dr. Sorensen. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here. And honestly, I'm, I'm learning a ton. So um, my background is as an emergency medicine physician. And, you know, with all this incredible research that's happening, I'd like to bring up the point that I would say less than 1% of this is getting translated down um, to the knowledge and training of our frontline health workers. That includes doctors, nurses, paramedics, anyone who is seeking or touching um, patients in, in the community. And that is a huge problem, right? Because, you know, sometimes people say, you know, you're an emergency doctor, what are you doing working at the intersection of climate change? And I said, you know, this is an emergency that's happening every day in our emergency departments. And, you know, we're talking about data and surveillance, you know, who is the first person to see a new case of Lyme disease somewhere where Lyme has never been reported? It's probably a family practice doctor or an emergency doctor or a pediatrician who's looking at a rash that they maybe saw a picture of um, in medical school, but have never seen it in their careers, right? And so until we're able to translate all this science down into health practice and clinical practice, we are not building um, the capacity in our health systems to be able to respond rapidly and appropriately when new pandemics or when new diseases are being seen in areas where they previously haven't been um, reported. So, you know, right now there are over 50 million doctors, nurses, dentists and pharmacists around the world, so 50 million, that's an incredible amount of people. And if they all had the knowledge and skills um, and could understand the science that's being done, I think we would have a very well prepared surveillance system um, that would simultaneously be able to respond quickly and appropriately to future pandemics or even you know, spillover events, or even just the spread of diseases into areas that they previously were not reported. So where I sit, I direct the Global Consortium on Climate and Health Education, and that's really the focus of our work is how do we bring climate and health, planetary health and one health education to all health professionals, right? Um, and we really feel like this is an interdisciplinary effort. We need to be speaking the same language. Um, nurses and doctors need to be talking together about this, right? Um, and we need to be talking to our pharmacists and, and dentists and anyone else who is really um, in this sphere. So just want you to keep that in mind, thinking about implementation of all this incredible work. Um, we've got to think about where the rubber meets the road in terms of our capacity and our ability to have resilient health systems. So I, I will you. also add veterinarians to that. Of course, absolutely. <laughs> okay, Dr. Rockleff, um, you can um, help to wrap this up. Thank you. Yeah, so um, thanks for, for the invitation. Um, various types of data from dif different sectors um, spanning climate, animal, human, and social sectors is, is really important. And it's really important um, to use this data in, in, a, in a smart way. So we could um, learn what's actually going on. I think the only way to really um, convince people and policymakers to take the appropriate action is is also describing um, these relationships. And um, especially if we want to take uh, action early um, in prevention, we need to. We can't wait and observe, um, you know, the, the animal or the human outbreaks. We actually need to use these relationships to show how things come together 
uh, without observing. So observing from the past or um, observe, observing from in different locations and then put it together um, using, for example, an epi model or um, uh, a system model uh, connecting um, climate environment to animals, to humans, and, and use that model um, to, to design prevention. Um, and we heard before that um, upstream prevention is likely to be much, much more powerful in, in uh, reducing uh, ill health and, and reducing the risk of pandemics or emerging infectious diseases. And, 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 and really uh, data and models together is really a cornerstone to, to make use of, uh, of, of uh, the information from surveillance systems uh, in, in informing prevention. In, in my work, um, that comes specifically for climate change, for example. Climate change is also an upstream prevention. There is a lot of climate impact that hasn't yet happened, that could happen in the future. And we need to collect, we can't wait 50 years and you know, see what's going to happen. We need to, to use the information we have today on drivers to disentangle drivers to build appropriate models to try to figure out what this can mean in terms of um, you know, outbreaks and emergence of infections and to inform um, what we can do today in terms of acting on these upstream drivers, which is, for example, climate change and what it means in terms of public health um, in, in the long term uh, future and, and the distant future. Um, so that's really important. What, can, what we cannot do um, uh, and prevent, we need to adapt to, of course. And there we could also use upstream information from, for example, climate, the climate system and, and El Nino conditions or, um, and, and to, to make uh, predictions and, and, uh, and forecasts of, of potential risks to outbreaks among um, animal, human systems to, to, uh, to, to build and to build a better basis for, for uh, strategizing on, on management and, uh, uh, and controlling those, those situations uh, as early as possible. Um, and for all of this, we really need to, 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 to make use of both in, if it's, Climate change we're talking about, we need to make use of climate data, of course, but we also need to make use of climate data in combination with other data sources like animal and human uh, disease surveillance. And I think what is also going to be really important and what's really important is also understanding. So we can't just build um, black box uh, models that give uh, fancy predictions. We need to actually provide interpretations to these models in order to to uh, both inform um, the interventions specifically and, and how powerful they could be, but also um, to, to give credibility to, to these models. Um, and, and if we could put the, if we could pull this together in, in, in using, for example, machine learning and AI technologies together with a lot of uh, new surveillance uh, from, from the di different sectors, I think we could we could really um, uh, provide much better and much smarter solutions for, for interventions and, and management, uh, both at the sort of proximal and the distal future, uh, which could safeguard our population and public health. So oh, thank you. Um, there's a theme there and all throughout, but the importance of relationships, and I'm struck by Dr. Redver's um, describing the narrative and the relationships. And I think that all our models and our data um, do, do need to include um, the relationships of the wisdom of everyone here. Science in a variety of different narrative forms is a very important stories are incredibly important to us in science and to us in the world. And to leave with that, I, I wanna say that um, there are a couple of things I wanna say, but there's a, an important question in the chat. Um, suburb science and scientists discussions. And I agree. How do we see it effectively translated to non-experts, legislatures, financing institutions, 
Uh, while One Health per se with the planetary link has gained traction, and from a veterinary perspective, it's amazing to watch it gain traction because we've lived with it for a while, um, but what next? And although you can't, we have no time for you to answer that, I think it's a very important point. What next? And there's hope. Um, I am awed by the four billion years I have shared with everyone here, including my trees outside on the planet. I, I think that's remarkable. I'm also awed by being with this group of people who makes me feel that the history that we have all been part of um, will move into a future. And I don't say that lightly. So um, I'm going to hand this back to Dr. Cordova, um, who will help to close. Um, and thank you, everyone. Great. Uh, those were terrific panels full of substance. Dr. Punt, fabulous job moderating. I thank the Aspen Institute for working with the Science Philanthropy Alliance to produce this program. And thanks to all of our engaged attendees for joining us today. This is a uh, really uh, started something or given it a lot of extra momentum. And I too look forward to engaging in what's next. We hope the discussion today left you with a new perspective on the intersection of climate change and infectious disease as you consider how the research questions emerging from that nexus might inform your own work. The Science Philanthropy Alliance will be working closely with philanthropic funders to maximize their giving in this area. I'm excited, excited to see what research uncovers in the years ahead. In the meantime, stay healthy, one health, one planet. Thank you.